Welcome back to Stories of Being. In this week's episode, I talked to Tessa Hawthorne. Tessa is a writer, lawyer, and now runs her own copywriting and content strategy business out of Mexico City. I went to high school with Tessa for a couple of years, really hadn't spoken to her in probably, I don't know, 20 plus years, but I had seen, I don't know, she just posted a few things and I thought, ooh, I think Tessa might have been through a bit of an evolution. Um, so I reached out to her and we organised this chat and, yeah, it was pretty much the first time we'd spoken, you know, for 20 plus years. So it was really cool to reconnect um, in this way and, yeah, just really get into a, you know, hearty conversation like this. In this conversation we talk a lot about the stories we tell ourselves and the ways in which these stories can impact the way we see ourselves but also the world, the quiet power of tuning into our intuition, how the work of Gabor Mate has changed the way she relates to herself, our ever-changing and evolving ways of being and what her new version of success looks like. Tessa is such a beautiful and eloquent speaker with such great insight and awareness so I really hope you get something out of the wisdom she shares and her own story and as always if you enjoyed this episode please like subscribe share it with a friend and I really hope you enjoy so our perception of ourself and the world can be shaped by the stories we tell ourselves so I'm curious to hear from you what have been the most dominant stories you've had historically, kind of what they were and how they've changed over over time? Yeah, it's such a big question and there are just so many of these stories. I mean, I think it's almost helpful maybe more than going into what those stories are, like unpicking what it means to have stories about ourselves which I'm sure is something you're like well versed in, but maybe from a listener perspective, it's sort of helpful. Like this idea that we go through our lives accumulating these stories that control the narrative inside our brains about who we are. But these stories are, they're kind of adaptations almost. Like we build these stories up to cope with the reality of the existence that's presented to us and like whatever feels difficult for us so I think I think when when you think about it like that I think a really good example of a story that I've had that I've recently been unpicking which ostensibly seems like a good story to have about yourself is that I'm this really strong person this really resilient strong person who can cope with things by myself at all times. And I think that that story has come from having a childhood where I had a lot of nannies, going to boarding school, you know, being single for really like long stretches of my life. So there's this story of like, I'm really emotionally resilient. I can do things by myself. Um, And I think that story has historically served me really, really well. Like it's in, in, in that sense of it being an adaptation it's like okay how do I cope with the reality of feeling alone I tell myself that I'm really strong and I'm really resilient and I can cope with so much by myself and I think like in the last few years and through through talk therapy and just through like lots of changes in life stripping that back and being like okay yes maybe I am strong and resilient but maybe this is a story I've created and and the negative outcome of that is like, do you, have I let people in properly? You know, have I made space for connection? Can I find meaningful partnership? And I think once I started deconstructing that story of I'm really resilient, I'm really strong, I can do everything by myself and being like, no, I'm actually really sensitive and I actually need people and I need connection and I need love. Like once I started unraveling that story, I was able to make a lot of other changes. I'm like, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. (laughs) About to drop an F-bomb, but I wasn't sure. That's fine. (laughs) I feel like, yeah, yeah, I can't even remember where the F-bomb was going, but basically, yeah, it's 
there are so many other stories. I feel like that that's one really prominent example that I think in the last few years has kind of found itself unraveling. And I'm like, okay, it's okay to be gentle and like, you know, and to need things. Yes. I think what you said about it being an adaptation is such, it's a really like lovely and kind of compassionate way to think about it because it's just, it's, it then doesn't become about you and who you are. It's just, yeah, like you said, the way that you've learned to deal with things. And I think, yeah, seeing it as an adaptation is really, it's actually really beautiful and quite like liberating and empowering in a way because it almost removes you from that story. Well, exactly. And I know you and I are both fans of the work of Dr. Gabor Maté. <laughs> yes, obsessed. <laughs> and I feel like that understanding his work was one of the entry points to, I mean, one of the one of the kind of programs or offerings that he has through his work or one of the like modalities is this idea of compassionate inquiry. So instead of like looking at our behavior and being like, why did I do that? Or, or looking at the ways that we're addicted to certain things and, and, and just thinking that we're sort of fucked up or messed up for that, going, what happened to cause me to adapt my behavior to need to, to do that? And I think the stories that we create are another version of that kind of adaptation that he talks about. Yeah. Because what else? So Gabor, for people who don't know him, is a Hungarian? He's a yes. um, Canadian he's a, now. Well, Canadian, Canadian, yes. Doctor who has done a lot of work in addiction, mental health, and has really, he's sort of, he's completely shifted the view or the way that we can view their yeah, mental health addiction, the struggles that people have. And you mentioned compassionate inquiry. Is there anything else? in his work that has really stood out to you and resonated with you or is it mainly that compassionate inquiry that sort of spoke to you the most? Yeah, so it started. So when I came over to Mexico City, I met my friend Lucy who I started the podcast with that you've listened to yeah. um, and she is a coach. So she was like worked on Canary Wharf in London, like full business mode, basically had a spiritual awakening and then she started coaching people and she did a lot of training through Gabor. So she kind of like introduced me to his work and that whole world. And then over time I started like reading his books and then I eventually did a compassionate inquiry course through him, which is like group therapy essentially. And it's this whole process of like, it sounds simple, but it's identifying when you're triggered. So understanding when you're having an outsized emotional reaction to what seems to be pretty innocuous stimuli. Um, and then not just recognizing that and controlling that, but stopping to understand what the emotion is that is occurring inside you and then getting, and then inquiring compassionately with yourself as to what that is and, and where it's come from in its deepest root sense. And so a lot of the work that Gabor does talks about like big T trauma and little T trauma and like little T, you know, the big traumatic stuff being exactly what you'd think it would be, you know, abuse, rape, you know, we know what that is. And then little T trauma being the stuff that happens to every single one of us. So one of the things Gabor says is if you've had a, if you've experienced childhood, you've experienced trauma, period. Like that's the, that that's the, rec that's the prerequisite for, for trauma. We've all experienced it. And a lot of it stems from, or most of it stems from our two core needs in life being attachment and authenticity and that when we're children, those two needs are at loggerheads all the time. So, you know, maybe you're doing a little dance as a little girl and your mom or your dad says to you, like, stop, stop showing off, you know, stop, be, be quiet, stop showing off. So your authenticity is like cut off at the knees and you're like, okay, well, for my parents to love me, I have to stop dancing and performing. And so, and it's not evil or wrong or bad that our parents do these things. It, it's it's natural. We're, we're all likely to do it to our own kids in certain ways. It, it's kind of impossible to avoid. Um, but yeah, so so what he teaches is that this is 
these disconnects and these like disconnections from our own authenticity are going to be happening all throughout our life and creating these kind of like little micro traumas. And so I've lost my train of thought. Where was I going with this? That that was a big part of what resonated with you. Yeah. Authenticity. I think, yeah, I think I was getting to the point around authenticity, the disconnect or the competing priority of authenticity and connection. And so understanding that and actually stopping and going, okay, I've had this really privileged life. You know, I was educated really well. I didn't want for anything. I, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like so many of us sit in that category, especially if you live in a place like Australia, like it's likely that you're in the top percent of privilege in a worldwide context. Mm -hmm. I think often we don't, and I know I didn't really think I had any cause to heal anything. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm behaving badly or dysfunctionally, I'm just a dysfunctional person as opposed to maybe there's some healing that that needs to happen from some trauma that's happened. And I think Gabor was able to like make that accessible and understandable in, 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 and to create space for compassion that I don't think I was ever able to have for myself. And I think in that way, like everybody can benefit from his work. Yes. And I think what he does so well and quite it's quite complex but also so simple is that he really thinks about root cause and you kind of touched on it then when you said what is my behavior a result of or an indication of it's like Mm -hmm. he thinks like okay so what's the root cause so he does a lot of work in addiction and it's not like he doesn't think of it like you're addicted to alcohol he thinks about it like why do you feel the need to drink? So it's that really like root cause thinking and going that extra step to actually get to the bottom of why something's happening and that, like you touched on earlier, it's an adaptation rather than just you're behaving in X, Y, Z way. Stop doing that. It's the why, which is I think something so broadly is just missing across so many categories, but it's really, yeah, it's going into into the detail and the why of why something is happening or why someone might be doing something. Exactly. And I think also like in that space around addiction, Gabor, I mean, he he worked in like hectic addiction recovery centres in in Canada, yes. but he extends that notion of addiction to all kinds of addictions. Like everybody yes. has addiction of, of different kinds and he includes himself in that category, like addiction to work, addiction to shopping, addiction to, you know, whatever it might be. And I think... I think it's really helpful. I think there's so much in our culture that says addiction is a really binary thing. You're addicted or you're not addicted. And particularly when it comes to stuff like drugs and alcohol too, like you're an addict or not, or you're not, you have a problem or you don't have a problem. And I think particularly in a culture like ours Mm. where drinking and recreational drug taking is like far more normalized than it should be. It means that a lot of people are walking around with these like mid-level problems, but they're like, oh, I don't need, I don't need, I'm not, you know, I don't need to go to rehab. Yes. I can get to work every day. I can do, you know, it's just on the weekends. It's just this. So no one is willing to look at it and say this exists on a spectrum and maybe I'm doing this just on the weekends because I'm numbing pain that exists that's so much deeper. And I think if we started not looking at it, like you have to go to AA or you have to stop drinking altogether, or we'd have people having much more functional relationships, like with yes. self you know? Yes, exactly. And yeah, I mean, Australia and lots of places, but culturally the it's culture wild. around it is, is actually wild. Okay. In Australia, I don't think there's anywhere else that matches Coming, living here in Mexico and like talking to my partner now and just sort of telling him what it's like in Australia. It's actually really funny. We have this, um, these friends who are a couple and he's Australian and she's Mexican. And he would like regale her with stories about kind of, you know, what it's like in Australia. And she'd be like, I don't really believe you. It can't be that. You can't be like that. And I do the same with Carlo. And then we sat down at dinner, all the four of us. And it was just so funny. Like the, our, the, the, the things we'd been explaining matched up perfectly and we were like, yep, see, proof. <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah. Culture, yeah. 
Yeah, and if you don't want to do it, then you're like considered, you know, like if you go out and you're like, oh, I'm not drinking, the, yeah. the pressure and the like what is with you around it is like, okay, yes. like, it just doesn't affect you at all, but okay. Like Huberman Lab, um, you know, Andrew Huberman? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Um, he like alcohol is the one drug that if you if you don't do it, people ask you if you have a problem. Yes, totally. Like, so I definitely want to go into the relationship stuff later. But was was your move to Mexico like? Was any of did any of that have to do with some of the behaviors or life you were living in Melbourne? Like, what was the catalyst and you know, I guess the journey up to you making the decision to move? So, no, I think it's interesting. Like the whole decision to move, it's funny how you can like write a story retrospectively when something's mm-hmm. happened, and, like tie a neat ball around it. But so I was actually living in Sydney before I left. I had two, I'd had whatever, like 15 years in Melbourne and then nine months in lockdown, like solitary confinement in Melbourne, living by myself. It was hell. And then the borders lifted. I moved to Sydney, kind of had like an existential crisis around work and left. I was kind of in a leadership role at a startup, you know, doing the whole like a girl boss tech thing. I was kind of waking up every day and being like, this cannot be it. Like, I don't love this and I'm not happy. And when you're sort of locked in a house day in, day out with your own thoughts, those thoughts become pretty loud. So I left that job and I moved to Sydney, which is like the furthest I could get at the end of 2020. And and then I didn't really do anything. I just like started, I just started freelancing. I was like living at my dad's house. I was like, I feel like I'm fucking my life up, but I also can't do anything else right now like I was Mm -hmm. just giving myself a bit of grace to be honest Mm -hmm. and then I started freelancing so I started doing just like a bit of freelance writing and a bit of freelance legal work and then that actually just became a business quite quickly like I was really lucky it built kind of easily and then in that year in 2021 when we kind of went into lockdown again in Sydney um hang on need a sip of water I um I kind of took that opportunity that six months. I was like, I'm just going to go completely inwards. Like I'm going to train for a half marathon. I'm going to, you know, not have a drop of alcohol. I'm not going to like no vices, no nothing. And I just got insanely quiet in my mind and a lot of stuff came up, but it wasn't on any sort of spiritual level it was quite cerebral like I was reading a lot of stuff I was opening up the doors I think that then led to a much deeper journey once I got to Mexico but it was this kind of like yeah maybe maybe there's something else or there's something more to life and then and then the Mexico idea just kind of dropped in from somewhere I was like okay well I have this freelance Mm -hmm. business I can work from anywhere I may as well keep doing this so that I can be overseas for a period of time. And then I booked a flight to Mexico and I just like got on the plane and and went over there. So like, no, I don't think I was in some like terrible state making like series of bad decisions. Then I was like, I have to get away. I was kind of already in that, that incubator of COVID and, and sitting with myself and being like, I, I just want, I want something more. And yes. I don't think I'm, it. And I think being single in your 30s is like an experience of its own that's like beautiful and expansive and off and and very and it can become very difficult when you're surrounded by all the people who've been your peers and then they're starting to get married and have babies and you're like, well, what if I just sit around waiting on yeah. like him? It just doesn't feel very productive. So I was like, no, I'm gonna go and like learn Spanish and like be somewhere random and you yes. Know. Yeah. It's it's yeah. It it sounds like it was um like quite an intuitive decision. I don't know if that's right, but I think it's also interesting that that opportunity or that thought happened when you had gone inward. And sometimes it feels like 
when there is distraction and we're busy and we're running around and we're going out, whatever it is, there's not the space to listen to ourselves and have those just thoughts pop into our minds and to actually follow it. So does that kind of resonate? And if so, is it the first time you've kind of felt that place of going inward and then the ability to then listen and follow, you know, that little cue or breadcrumb or whatever it might be? Yes. Like I I definitely think the space, I think people credit COVID with like various difficulties and then various positives and they're kind of different for different people. And I think like I'm so grateful that I now that I was alone during that time and that I and that I I guess had the courage to be like I'm gonna get quiet. I'm not gonna busy myself mm. in this space. I'm really gonna try and listen to myself. But it's funny I actually um I had a flight book to Italy. I think I had some like eat, pray, love oh yeah things. I was like Italy. It's got, to be, <laughs> yes. it's got to be Italy. So I had booked a flight to Rome and then a friend who was also a, a male friend of mine who was also in a similar like just, you know, not sure what he was doing. He was like Mexico City is meant to have this amazing expat community and he was telling me about it and something, something deeply intuitive was like that's where you're meant to be. Yeah. And I just anyone I didn't pull anyone I like nothing I just like quietly changed my flight and was like that's where I'm going which is so interesting because I look back and I'm like yeah that was deeply intuitive and then when I was here I, I think I was here for about six months and I was like what do I like what what am I doing you know I'm rolling around Mexico Lucy who'd kind of become my best friend she'd left I was like this is now starting to feel a bit dicey like <laughs> <laughs> what have I done <laughs> fun and I think I need to go and like you know, yeah. give a real again and then and then I was sitting in this yoga class in Shavasana it's like such a fucking cliche but I was lying there in Shavasana just like really quiet and I was like no you have you have another year left here mm. and I think I'd started doing a I'd started going down a lot of spiritual rabbit holes here and I was like this feels like the place to be to be doing that work and like everything else is a story about where you're meant to be yeah and what you're we're doing at 33, 34, whatever I was then. And so I was like, I'm going to stay another year. And then two months later, like I met my partner and, it, yeah. and I was like, mm, yeah, like just following those little nudges internally. It's, it's huge. And it does, like you said, it can sound so cliche, but it's actually legitimate and I think it's it's interesting that following the cues or the breadcrumbs it's come it's been like a bit of a theme just in the conversations I've had on this podcast and it's like when you can actually when you're there's more stillness or you're you can be more inward you have the ability to see those more and it's they're not necessarily massive things but it's just like you then really start to notice the things that keep appearing or how you feel about something and then being able to tune into that in order to then make a decision or whatever it is. But it's quite, again, it's quite simple, but it can be so powerful, I think. Have you ever done your human design? Yeah, I did that maybe six months ago. Interesting. How did you get a lot from it? I got so much from it. I didn't know anything about it. Like I just kind of seen it pop up. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, do it and it was it was fascinating so I'm a projector and okay, interesting yeah but my perception of myself is always like at work and things like that like I just get shit done I do it quickly like I just go 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 mm-hmm. go go and that a projector is kind of the opposite it, it really shifted something and gave me a different lens yeah of just viewing things it was it was fascinating yeah I'm a I'm a um, manifester so like intense bouts of energy and commitment and then I just kind of have got nothing for a while and then it comes back and I might intensely have intense amount of output and then nothing and I'd always thought my whole life like is there something like will I ever be positive again during these periods and now I'm like hey no I'm just in so it's like this it's given me to kind of follow my 
energetic pattern, I think. Yes. But my, I was going to say like back to the intuition thing. So a huge part of my human design composition is like your intuition is like the strongest part Mm -hmm. of you. And if you do not follow your intuition, like watch your life blow up more so than people. And if you do, and you're really in tune with it, like, yeah, just watch it kind of blossom beyond your wildest dreams kind of thing. So I don't know, that sounds like it could apply to anyone and maybe it can and, you know, whatever, but it's definitely, it's definitely been helpful for me to find the trust in my intuition and not think I'm mad. But yes. Like I have a feeling. You know? yes, totally. I, I haven't listened to it yet, but I saw someone was talking about a podcast the other day basically around this it was like what if in boardrooms or meetings or in situations where saying things like oh that just doesn't feel right became the norm you know in a boardroom now no one's going to sit there and say oh that doesn't feel right like that decision but it is it is a power and I think we don't we just completely discredit it and everyone has it I think mm. some people are more in tune with it than others, but every human has it. And the same way that animals do, you know, it's, mm. it's like a biological function. But if, if it could be something that we actually could legitimately base decisions on in different settings, I think it, it's, it can kind of change everything. And the, it's the, that shift from everything being, obviously we need logic and reason and all of that sort of stuff. But there's also another side of that which is also legitimate, you know? I know, and I think it comes down ultimately to just like the way our society is structured from a patriarchal perspective. 100%. <laughs> oh, you know, trickles down. It needs a, a bit of woo-woo sprinkled totally. in there. A bit of the feminine, a bit of the woo-woo, and I think, you know, we'd be in a different direction. Totally. I 100% agree. I really think it's it's massive. So you're, when you're working in the tech startup, you're very much in that girl boss mode. You mentioned that you were feeling like there is more to life than this. And I'm curious if that feeling was really new or if you'd had that before, right. had kind of just you know hustled on and kept going and sort of squashed it down or if yeah it was always kind of there no no it was definitely it was definitely new or if I had felt it in the past like I so I started my career as a family lawyer and I worked in litigation and family law for like five years and I remember I remember getting, I had an amazing boss. Like I loved my job. I really, really loved it. It felt meaningful. I felt like I had heaps of purpose, but I remember getting to sort of five years in and being like, so what, I'm just going to like roll around the court district in Melbourne every day and like take the same like custody battle in a different guise every week. And that just feeling crushing to me. Like yeah. I, I have to do something. And I don't think looking back, it probably was the same intuitive whisper or it was the same the way I would now phrase it is the universe trying to wake you up a little bit Mm. instead of taking it in that way I think I just went okay got to find another job got to find something more commercial got to find something broader got it you know so I went traveling for a year and then kind of just started the whole cycle again in a different (laughs) industry being like spiritual exploration or whatever yeah yeah, and it's yeah, it's interesting. The whisper was always there, but it was just kind of pushed. It's aside. funny. About that. I don't think I'd, I've ever thought about that before. Like that's the first time I'm answering that question, and I'm like, I wonder if that's what that was. But I, I think in terms of that whole notion of going on a spiritual journey, going through an awakening. I think there's a lot in, I don't know, popular culture that says like maybe that's like an overnight thing or you, you. but it, I, I think it's part of the process of being human. Like we are born, we go through our childhood. Some people are born with a greater sense of consciousness than others um, and it's a process of 
becoming more aware of our consciousness. Like I think it's part of every human being's journey. And I think some people get not very far at all in that Mm. journey through a lifetime. Some people get really far, like, and it's, I mean, that's a whole other question about like what is consciousness and like how does that, yeah, which I I don't know if that's like a rabbit hole you want to go down, but um, (laughs) but I think, yeah, I, I think it's like a series and, and when when that starts happening and you can maybe start putting words to your belief system or or what it is that's been happening to you, you can then start looking back and going, oh, yeah, like that was a piece of it. Or like for me, like I had had a loss in my life. I had a couple of losses close to each other and they were definitely like little pieces of an awakening, but like little baby steps that were shaking me being like, yeah, what? what's the meaning of life essentially you know yes um yeah do you know um a guy called peter crone no i'll i'll send him to i think you'd really like him but he he's like um i don't know what you call him but he he's kind of overarching philosophy is that everyone is born with a lens you know through which they see the world and themselves like I'm not good enough, um, I'm not worthy, you know, all of those sorts of things. And, the, yeah, the the meaning of life, in inverted commas, is about breaking free of that and that we're always presented with yeah. um, stimulus stories, people, all of these things to then break free of it. Um, but he's fascinating. You'd really like him. I'll send him to you. Yeah, um but it's, I think it's true. I think we do get similar people come into our lives, all of these things, jobs might come up, all of this, these things happen and we either can figure out if it's right or wrong and we're always being tested, you know, by something bigger, I think. Yeah, the way Lucy of podcast fame and I always <laughs> talk about it is like we sort of ask each other like why do some people seem to quote unquote wake up and other people don't I think one part of that is like what I was just saying I think everybody is in their own process of awakening it's just like to what degree and how quickly and at what point in your life but I think there are like these moments where I think the universe is like really trying to wake you up yeah you do have a as to how much you go, you go with the way the river is flowing. You're like, I'm trying to, is there a lesson here? And it's about how quiet you can get, how much you can listen, how much you can, instead of going, this terrible thing happened to me, like how awful and I'm a victim, be like, okay, there's a lesson here. There's something. And, and yeah, it's, I, I look back at, And I think a lot of people look back at their 20s like this as just looking at myself coming up against a lot of like roadblocks, like obvious disasters and kind of thinking I didn't really have anything to do with it or that, you know what I mean? Like, like, which is really funny to me now because I'm like, oh, my God, like you were the common denominator girlfriend. Like, Yes, (laughs) yes, totally, 100%. Um, And there were lessons and these were all attempts, like someone rattling my cage, someone being... I I think something bigger than me to be like, you're not living the way you're meant to be living and you're not aligned with your life's purpose. And so I'm trying to throw shit at you to make you see that. And then I think the minute like I started listening to that, my life started getting a lot easier. So, yeah. Is that how you define an awakening or a spiritual journey? Like, how would you define that? I'm also, like, not an expert on any of this. I just want oh, like, no, but no one is. I mean, like, like I'm not. I think it's different for everyone, you know, so there's not one answer at all. Exactly. I think. Your experience. How would you, in your experience, define <laughs> it? My, in my tiny little experience, I would define it as, or I think something that really helped me understand, I think, what, happened to me over the like last two to four years was like 
a series of ego deaths. And when I say ego death, like I know that's not going to be like a familiar term to everybody, but it's this idea that if we think about like ego being our perception of the world and believing that perception to be true. Mm -hmm. So our ego kind of protects that perception. Like I'm this and the world's that. And, you know, this is, and it's, again, it's like ties into the whole idea of stories. And when suddenly it's like a veil lifts and you're like, things are not as I thought they were. Like they're not all those stories I told myself and all those things I thought were completely true. Like they were my truth. They were the truth I lived in. And somehow like, and and it's like, bit by bit, you know, things keep aligning, things keep happening. It, it, it starts being unreasonable to keep believing in that previous truth to the point where you're like, okay, I now have a changed perception. It's like your ego dies in that, like you're having an ego death. And I mm-hmm. think they have big and small ways. But what what happens, I think, in that process is also like a huge amount of grief. Like my experience, particularly in Mexico and like, just engaging with like different modalities and like somatic stuff and different ceremonies and talk therapy and lots of different stuff was like this avalanche of grief. And it was, I think, grieving the death of my perception of the world as it was and who I was and and the embarrassment that comes with that too because you're like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought it was, it's humiliating. So, and, and, and to also be aware that I'm fully aware that I'm, I'm going to have, I hope more of these ego deaths in my life. And right now I'm going to be on record saying all this stuff to you and it'll probably all make me cringe beyond belief in like a few years time, you know? Yes. So I think that's, that's what it feels like to me, yes. what it means to have an awakening of some kind. Yes. And I think the ego thing, just the ego in general is again just a way to make us feel safe. So when we have those um, shifts in perception or perceptions or those deaths, it's like the thing that was keeping us safe has yeah. dissipated, and that can be really uncomfortable and not scary, but like there's so much unknown in it, along with the grief and everything else. So it's a really like it's can take a while I think to get to the place where you're then like okay with it because it's what's kept us safe for such a long time yes and it to that point around it it being an adaptation yeah it's 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 an adaptation to cope and then it's not there anymore and it's not to say that you don't dip into all of your old it's not well, again, my experience is not like, oh, like I shed this version and now I'm this version and I don't behave like that. The, the hard part is that sometimes I do default back into, you know, I don't know, reacting in a way that I absolutely know is not the right way to react. And instead of just going, oh, it's normal, I'm like, oh, like it's, there's a really painful part of becoming more conscious because you can't get away with the same stuff you yes. get away with internally. Like yes. you don't, yourself get it you're holding yourself to a different set of standards or a different reality and you're still growing into the new version and that's uncomfortable too so yes yeah Yeah. and also knowing that like you just said that it will evolve and change and morph again that can be hard because I think as well people who you know it's like I've had an awakening and I'm this and I'm that they're then actually holding tightly to that new version which is again just an ego you know and a way to identify with something or someone or whatever it is so that having the um the view of it all evolve and change is really important because then you're not tied or identified so much with this new version of yourself Yes. And, and I also think like there's so much like ego in this, in the spiritual quote unquote world, a lot of like spiritual ego, like I'm this conscious and I'm this evolved. And I, I understand, you know, and it's like none of us really, no, really understand. And yeah, it's, it's a dangerous, slippery yes. part. There's just a lot of people like 
sniffing their own butts in the totally. spiritual world. Sure. And, exactly. And it's just an, it's a way then to like elevate and kind of separate yourself from everyone else because you're better, because you're more evolved or conscious or whatever, but it's just a separation from everything else. Yeah. And I think, I I think a lot about Gabor Mate's work in like compassionate inquiry, like when I'm seeing someone or interacting with someone who's, I don't know, like not vibrating at the highest level, I try and think like, well, where were you at five years ago, 10 years ago? Yes. And and everyone's on a growth journey and everyone has the capacity to change, learn, grow. And and what's causing this person to be like this rather than just writing that person off as a terrible person? I think I think without that piece, any kind of quote unquote enlightenment is kind of empty to a degree. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So you met your now fiancé, Carlo, in Mexico. And it's funny, I wrote this question down without really having an idea of your relationship history, like zero. <laughs> but I just had a sense of, like, your relationship with Carlo and the patterns and the dynamic and all of that stuff is different from your previous relationship patterns and dynamics. and But I'm curious, yeah, about how he and your relationship is different from previous relationships and also if you found it difficult to, um, yeah, have that with him because it was different. Do you know what I mean? From previous patterns and relationships. Yeah, yeah. Where to begin? Well, firstly, like I... I think it's no coincidence that I, like, you know, you end up single in your mid thirties. Um, oh, I ended up, let, let me start again. <laughs> let me start again. I don't think it's any coincidence that I started really looking inwards and like doing the work as they say. Um, and then I met someone that I was not only like able to have, a healthy relationship with but that I really love and and want to be committed to like those two things are just unequivocally not a coincidence like if Carlo had met the me of even a year before we, we met you know when I was I think in a really good place I still I still think there's like some divine timing there of like exactly when we met being the right time um and I think I think if I had met someone like him, I wouldn't have been interested. Like Um, I was so wired to, I have that gorgeous mix of anxious and avoidant attachment. Perfect. What a combo. (laughs) Or historically have done. So like (laughs) my pattern was like chasing deeply unavailable people, like uh, to the end of the earth, (laughs) deep, deep commitment, like, they could tell me outright, like, I'm not available. I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm okay, sold. Yeah, you set the challenge and I will go after it. <laughs> um, and then if I did end up with somebody loving and available, it would make me want to hurl and run away within six months. So that was like, in a nutshell, kind of my patterning. And and again, like, it's really funny to me to look back and be like, how did I not pick up on this when I was like 21 let alone like 31, because it seems so obvious in retrospect, you know, what was happening. Um, But I think really working through the wounds, the patterning and, and getting to, yeah, getting to a much better place Mm -hmm. made space for somebody who is like incredibly stable, incredibly kind, incredibly loving. Um, and I just, yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't have done that before or doing some work on myself. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And I guess, like you said, he wouldn't have appeared, you know, no. No. if you weren't ready. Not, not at all. Like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a crazy story, actually. So we met, 
we saw each other running in the park and we would kind of like see each other. And then I sat down at this restaurant and this was in like, I arrived in, I guess, like early March to yeah. Mexico City. And we saw each other running and then never waved or anything, just like saw each other. And then in May, I sat down at this kind of street food restaurant and he was sitting there and the owner kind of sat us together. He saw the owner sort of vaguely knew both of us, sat us together. We chatted. And I remember not being like, oh, I want to like go on a date with that guy, but just being like, oh, there's something very special about that man. And I think he's going to come back into my life. And I could find a way to pursue him, you know, because I sort of knew the owner of this restaurant, whatever. But I had this deep, again, to that point around intuition. I was like, don't, don't, huh. it, it, it'll come back if it should. And then come like October, we started, I started seeing him in the park again. And then we were waving at each other because we'd met in the restaurant. And then, and then we got connected by his friend and ended up going out for our first meal. But he had said to me, like, once we were, you know, together properly, he was like, I was not in the right place in May. I was, he was kind of going through a lot of like ceremonies and was like in some other land at the time. And and I was kind of in this big adventure and I was with Lucy and I was, you know, it, and so it's so funny, even that timing of like when we first technically met to when we started dating, it's like I needed that eight months. Yes. Uh, yeah. And those little bits of timing, they're, they are so significant. Yeah. It's crazy. Crazy. You mentioned um, that you've done kind of talk therapy and other kind of like somatic modalities was that did that all start when you arrived in Mexico like had you explored talk therapy and different modalities in terms of like personal development and growth and all that sort of stuff prior to being in Mexico yeah talk therapy since like my early 20s yeah Uh, you know it's kind of such a normalized thing in society but yeah somatic somatic practices and yeah any everything outside of traditional talk therapy has all been since I've been here I think I actually had a really resistant view to anything that I saw as like quote-unquote alternative right before I arrived here like I yeah just from family stuff what you knew like do you know where that resistance came from yeah my and I don't say this with any um like judgment or negativity really but my my dad's pretty hardcore atheist Mm -hmm. so I grew up with like Richard Dawkins being like more important than the bible kind of thing um and I think and especially when you know my dad growing up was a real like intellectual hero for me so there's a lot of stuff tied into if you believe in something that is not provable by science you Mm. are a silly person I think that's very much the story I had that was so ingrained that I really believed other people were silly like I had so much judgment of anything that was like definitely anything religious and then you know within organized religion the word spiritual make me gag um yeah. like alternative stuff I was like who well, might be fun to try things but it's not actually going to work like I really I re- had a really really resistant um view to it all yeah and and how do you is it something you say things you experience or try or you're, you're now more spiritual side is that something you share with your family into I mean let's say specifically your dad or is it something that you sort of yeah, don't share because of that maybe resistance from his point of view. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of funny to say this because, like, we're on a podcast recording this conversation. <laughs> other people, no, like, for other people to to hear me say this because it's like I, I think talking about one's spiritual belief system, it feels not not because I don't want the judgment, but it it feels personal. Mm. It just feels like a private, personal set of beliefs that are evolving, which is why it sounds so ridiculous to be like say that and I'm like talking about it openly on a podcast. But yeah. I think it's different 
format where like if somebody's interested, they tune in and listen as opposed to like, hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, friend who I've known for a million years who doesn't see me that way. Let's talk about consciousness. Let's talk about, you know, it doesn't, I don't feel compelled or like I need to because everyone is on their own journey with their own set of beliefs and I'm not here to proselytize about mine. Yes. Yes. Uh, Somebody's interested and wants to tune in and they're at a place where they can can and want to hear that or they open up a conversation like sure but I I just I see no need yes and it would probably be very triggering you know like yes. <laughs> yes. your dad would probably be like that's silly come on <laughs> yeah yeah but no, no no to be fair like Carlo is an incredibly spiritual man mm. he's like not from this planet in my opinion and he will he sort of talks to my dad and I see my dad really opening okay if I said that to you you would laugh at me (laughs) totally kind of has a way of so it's been nice actually it's kind of been opening up that conversation a bit within our family yeah I think that's actually what you said is really like you don't have to have every and I'm I'm sort of figuring this out at the moment but not every you don't need to connect um with every person you know in your life about the same things so mm-hmm. one friend you might connect on x thing on another it might be something else and that's okay and there's people in your life as kind of multifaceted people and beings not everyone will tick the box of all of those facets so i think what you just said about having different conversations with different people is actually quite powerful. And it's like, yeah, there's just people you connect with some things on, but not others. And that's actually okay. And I also think, well, I take the view that whatever spiritual belief system is evolving in me Mm. and whatever consciousness is evolving in me, whatever work I do to better myself is going to have inevitably a ripple effect, whether that's even just like taking a yoga class and set, like centering your nervous system and then being around people with a calmer nervous system, like it, from that to, you know, doing an ayahuasca ceremony and whatever, it's like yes. that ripple effect is the impact. It's not yes. sitting down like now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is what I believe. This is what I think you should believe too. It's, yes. It's, yeah, it's it's smaller than that and gentler than that, I think. A hundred percent. And the sitting down and, which I have been, I'm getting a lot better at it, that sitting down and like you should believe this and that's wrong and blah, 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 is actually just coming from a place of judgment and not recognising that everyone is an individual and we all have our own truths and are on our own journey and that actually doing that is just kind of probably ego based and from a place of judgment which is the opposite of that ripple effect that you want right yeah exactly like I have this friend Anna shout out Anna if you're listening (laughs) (laughs) and she went to Central and South America for like two years and she she was already like kind of on a journey and she came back like very changed and I remember finding the change like a little bit confronting because I was still just so not there you know but being around her and like her gentleness her softness her approach I remember the resistance I felt but also like being interested in it and I now speaking of that like looking back and seeing the things that plant seeds in your own journey I'm like Anna planted seeds for me and I didn't even know that we planted at that time and that's you know that's like the epitome of that ripple effect I think yes yeah, totally. And you want to be, yeah, you just want to do your own thing and be in your own space. And and if that, yeah, prompts something in some someone else, then that's that's great. But it's it right. just yeah, it's not about changing or pushing things onto other people. And if you naturally, you know, if you have people in your life where you just become your the way you're living becomes so unaligned from how they're living, you're naturally likely to move apart and it doesn't have to be dramatic. It just will be. Yes. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, totally. And so one more question because I don't want to <laughs> keep you forever. So if you had to think about what success meant for you five, ten years ago and how you view success now, how has that changed for you in terms of what it means to be lead a successful life, I suppose, and, and what that life looks like? Yeah. It's hard to even know what I thought success was five or ten years ago, but I guess it was all the box checking stuff. Career. Like I was very much on a career trajectory thing, you know, the law, tech, like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And I think now just absolutely hitting unsubscribe from that whole girl boss, she, whatever thing that that was, I'm just like that. I have no time for that. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a life that where I have a calm nervous system. I feel like that is like the number one measure of success for me is like, and that's still so hard for me. Like I'm, I get um, overstimulated incredibly easily. Like my mind's racing all the time. Um, But if I'm around people that make my nervous system calm, if I'm finding ways to have a calm nervous system, like I feel good and I feel happy. And I think that the way into that is definitely like working for myself, mm. not being on any kind of full-time schedule, like having space. I want to think about, I think about spaciousness and rest and seasonality. Like there's a season for, especially with that manifesto energy that I was talking about, like there's a season for growth and then there's just a season to relax and unsubscribing from all the structures and the timelines and then nine to five and the Monday to Friday, like just having an integrated life where everything I'm doing feels good. Yes. Um, That was such a wishy-washy answer, but. No, I think it's, (laughs) I think it's, I mean, yeah, it it, it makes sense. I think I've been, I mean, this is a whole, (laughs) I've been thinking a lot about the patriarchy, right? And that's, it's obviously it's been around. Huge... I'm like, it's around. It's, it's around. around. <laughs> and it's a huge topic and there's more conversation around it. But what I think is missing is it's conversations like this, like how we view success now is, is benefits no one but the patriarchy in terms of like big business, dominant, you know, run by men, do you know what I mean? It's like we're all just on or not, but we're on this hamster wheel and and we fundamentally need to, for some people maybe that's great, but for a lot of people that's actually not serving them or their families or, you know, their community. It's serving the patriot. No, I think we're so out of connection with our essential nature. Mm. And even, even if I can carve out, or anyone can carve out a spacious life and you live in a city, Mm. like you're subject to madness every day. And it's, it's, I actually heard someone say recently that every system we live in is built off the back of a worthiness wound. Mm. Like, you know, having to earn more, having to build more capitalism, um, consumerism, everything. It's just built off a worthiness wound and we're all just trying to prove 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 and it's like yeah the more we can and it's you know it's not always possible to totally unsubscribe like we're we're social animals and we're going to want to follow what's around us and we're going to want evolution which means getting better at the things that we do and I think that's also very natural but it's like choosing which things and choosing your why a bit more closely yes yeah yeah and that comes back to being able to to having like you said the space spaciousness but tuning in and understanding what that is for you so for some people that might be you know what it looks like now but it's just knowing and and feeling like the decisions you make and the life you live is autonomous rather than just coming from a place of autonomy rather than something you're just doing because that's what you do and that's what everyone else is doing. 
Exactly. And like these things are just inevitably kind of inextricably <laughs> bound up in each other. It's so hard to yes. pick them apart. But I think you're right. Like the more we can examine it, the more of those little ego deaths we'll keep having. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Tessa. I'll link to all of her info in the show notes um, and also include her Substack because she, yeah, she puts out some really beautiful pieces of writing in her own kind of musing, so it's definitely worth checking out. I'll also link to a one or two Gabble Moore Marte podcast, not to be too much of a fangirl, um, but he's someone that, yeah, Tess and I kind of spoke a bit about and, yeah, both kind of got a lot out of. So, yeah, I'll link to a podcast or two that he's been on. Um, so if you're interested in his work, you can check them out. 